inaugural HP, um, advanced GI grand rounds. So it's my pleasure uh, with uh, Dr. Kurtz and Dr. Walsh to be leading this effort on um, trying to uh, put some structure and some more um, uh, conferences around the advanced GI fellowship programs that are sponsored by the SSAT. Uh, I was, uh, thank you to Annie Benzi, who's our uh, uh, Advanced GI Fellow, who I volunteered to do this first talk, and uh, really excited to have her. Uh, thank you to Dr. Cho, who's on the call, who's the Associate Program Director uh, for our fellowship here at Methodist and Richardson. And a big thank you to Ralph A for agreeing to, uh, uh, to co-moderate this. The idea is to try to make this as interactive as possible and really to try to have uh, the fellows uh, interact uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the speaker and with, the, uh, with some of the questions that Annie has put together. Um, we are recording this with the hope that we can post this on uh, Facebook Live or on some other outlet to let others uh, jump in. Um, I do want to thank Dr. Stain for joining us. Uh, he is the president of the Board of Trustees and the past president of the SSAT, and it, it means a lot to us that you took the time to join us, Dr. Stain. Thank you for supporting education with the SSAT. Um, without further ado, I think I'll hand over to Dr. A to start moderating this, and I'll jump in to help if I, if, if I can. Uh, feel free, uh, please, to uh, pick on anyone that you feel like picking on, Dr. A. And uh, Annie has some uh, poll functions too, so she'll um, she'll be able to show those results. I think LKU will help us with that, and uh, and we'll move forward. So, Dr. A. Thank you, Dr. Jairaja, uh, and thank you to the SSAT for uh, the privilege of participating in this. Um, it's a great topic to kick off this series, I think, and I commend both Dr. Jayaraja and Dr. Benzi for putting together a great presentation, and I've reviewed the talk in advance, and it's a good talk. This is a subject that um, comes up on every board exam, um, and um, so it's a good thing to review. It's a complex subject. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all, so I think this will be a great exercise uh, going through a case presentation and considering all the uh, variables and the potential uh, alternate choices for, um, for management. Um, so I'll leave it to Dr. Benzi. Thank you. Okay, thank you both very much. I'm just going to share my screen really quick. Can everyone hear me? It's usually a problem around here. You're good. Awesome. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, as Jairaja, uh, Dr. Jairaja said, this is the inaugural Grand Round. So any suggestions, comments, concerns, this is a completely interactive session. Um, so please feel free to chat us in at any time. Um, and we do anticipate your um, participation in our survey questions. There's no right answer, even though everyone always has their opinion of the right answer. Um, but I really just wanted this to be more of an interactive session um, just to get kind of ideas that will help us in our future practice. Um, so a topic without further ado is an esophageal emergency um, and focusing really on the perforated esophagus. So I have no comic of interest yet. Uh, just a disclaimer, you know, I've been a fellow for about two months. I've never done independent practice. So a lot of this experience is uh, like N of equals five for me, um, but I luckily have very experienced co-moderators that have been helping me out. So where are we going tonight? Um, as far as background, surgical dogma, and then we'll talk about some management strategies, both operative, non-operative, and also newer endoluminal options. And then talk about the outcomes um, of esophageal preparation and conclusions. So how did this all start? I'm sure all of you have sat in a medical school classroom at one time or another and learned about the Baron um, that Herman Borhav spoke about back in the day. So he was actually a Dutch admiral that liked to induce vomiting after being a glutton. And during one of those episodes of vomiting, he passed away. Of course, the, uh, the name Borhav syndrome didn't come for him until 
his autopsy. So it wasn't really helpful in his case, but that's kind of where we first describe um, that first instance of esophageal perforation. That was back in the late 1700s and really care since then kind of progressed through these large invasive surgeries, very high morbidity, very high mortality. And it really wasn't until the late 1970s that John Cameron started thinking about this non-operative management of what happens when patients have esophageal, esophageal perforations. Um, of course, there's very selected group that, you know, that management strategy can be employed for. Um, but it's something that's significant um, in the history of esophageal perforation. And then coming more to present day, um, we're all familiar with our trauma systems and how we started developing the leveling system um, through the ACS, um, as well as localized regional centers of care of excellence for trauma surgery, cardiac surgery, and other strategies. So at Indiana University, they're actually a level one esophageal perforation center of excellence. So they really started regionalizing their care um, and making this really streamlined process until how all of their patients get taken care of that present with esophageal perforation. So it's definitely been a progression of care um, and improvement in outcomes, different management strategies. Um, and of course, it's all for the well-being um, of the patients that pre present in these situations. However, I'm sure that anyone that is actually taking care of a patient with an esoph esophageal perforation will have the same feeling um, that I've had on occasion. Um, it really does, it is something that keeps you up late at night, doesn't let you sleep. You're always worried about that patient, always thinking of all the complications that can happen and everything that can go wrong in that story. Um, and I think just the title to itself um, from this article really speaks volumes. Um, in terms of you know, how this is still uh, a situation in which patients are really in dire straits. It's akin to the gunshot wound to the abdomen trauma patient um, that you're really trying to take care of and do the best you can. Um, and it's really something that requires a lot of preparation, not only through your surgical training, but also through experience um, and continuing evolution of learning new management therapies and strategies that can help you um, when that patient does show up at your door. So let's start off the interactive part. Some questions for you. And a lot of this has to do with the surgical dogma, quote unquote, um, that we've all been taught. So number one, go ahead, LK, if you can launch this for us. I was taught that all esophageal perforations are ideally treated with surgery if they present within the first 24 hours. We've got six out of the 11 folks so far with a reply in here. We've got a couple more responses. All right, we have nine out of the 11. So I'm gonna end the poll and show the results. You should be able to see them, Annie, correct? Um, oh, no, I have to hit share results. Now you should. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> No problem. So yeah, this is definitely something that is kind of written in almost all the textbooks that are reviewed in making this talk. And the interesting part of this is that there's not any real credit or a reference article or anything that's attributed, you know, to where this idea came from. Um, but if you think about it, it makes sense, right? The sooner you find the injury, the sooner you're able to treat it because you have less contamination and your patient's generally not tipped over the edge yet. So that's kind of where this idea comes. Um, the other side of that tends to be that if that perforation has been frozen for 24 hours, you really shouldn't go marching in there and do an operation on that patient. Um, so like I said, my N equals about five in these cases of esophageal perforation, two of which those patients have been perforated for about seven days, um, and they were successfully managed with operative therapy. So I mean, at least in my anecdotal experience, you know, that's not always the case. I really think that you have to consider the entire patient picture. Um, and I'm just interested in kind of in what you guys think about, you know, have you ever heard this kind of strategy item to or decision making point? Well, so I think in, in my experience, um, and I, I trained it mostly at a trauma center, at a level one trauma center. But we ideally, when we saw these patients, if they're small contained perforations, we typically didn't um, go to the OR necessarily. Uh, again, it just depended on the timing and the, 
kind of the location and also just the overall clinical picture of the patient. Thank you. Annie, thanks for uh, differentiating between um, the timing of intervention and the option for still intervening beyond that 24 hour period. I think um, there are some data on um, worse outcomes beyond that 24 hour window, but I think the point you're making strongly is that just because it's beyond 24 hours, we don't uh, lose our ability to intervene with success. Yep, thank you, exactly. Okay, next question. Oops, sorry. So how about this case? Um, so our patient is 56. He presented to the emergency room with chest pain, epigastric pain. That was about four days of duration. He had really dark emesis. He was febrile, tachycardic, white count of 21, um, an ALT, <laughs> ASC, mild elevation with ALP elevation as well. So if you had this patient, what would be your first diagnostic study? Which, of course, I know the emergency room is always going to order a chest x-ray and a CAT scan. But theoretically, if you were just seeing this patient, what would be your first go-to? All right, we have about 30, 40% of the votes in. We'll let a few more people vote. And then we'll share the results. So it's 60% of the votes in. All right, I'm gonna end polling and then I should be able to share results. Awesome, yeah, so 55% upper GI followed by CAT scan. So this is an interesting point too. It's like when you have that ED non-contrast CAT scan, you know, what do you do with that information? Um, so I think this is something that's becoming more common is that we um, get both. Typically the gold standard people talk about is upper GI. Um, we're gonna talk about this in a few slides, kind of what your options are. Um, but I think upper GI followed by CAT scan really gives you the best information that you can make an informed decision with. If anyone has any comments on that, if they've ever done anything differently Feel free to chime in too. So, um, Dr. A, do you want to comment on that and, and sort of ask the audience what their thoughts are? Well, I think, you know, we don't know in advance that this patient has an esophageal perforation, except that that's the topic of the discussion. <laughs> so, um, but the CT certainly, I think, is important because we're looking for causes for the overall picture, sepsis and chest pain, et cetera. Um, I certainly don't disagree with the upper GI followed by CT. I think the CT is probably your number one modality here, but it's not as sensitive for, in our experience, isn't as sensitive for perforation as the upper GI. And I know Annie's gonna talk about that. And then don't forget endoscopy in this patient who had hematemesis, uh, dark hematemesis. So that will need to be done, um, not initially. James, do you have any comments from your experience? No, so so far I agree. I mean, I know um, you know from being on your service, um, having some of these patients where we had you know done some type of an upper GI followed by a CT scan. Um, especially, we use this a lot postoperatively as well for some of our patients. If we're if there's any question of could there be uh, some type of a leak, I feel like that's a pretty valuable way to go. But I also agree with Dr. A. I mean, so far with this patient presentation other than the topic that we know. Um, I mean, I may have started just with a CT because I, I wouldn't have necessarily known um, anything about the esophagus for this person, um, just based on the information we got. And I think, you know, one of the thing that comes up is really the ability to get an upper GI, right, at certain hours of the night, et cetera. And then also uh, the ability of some of our neoradiologists to do an upper GI. They're so uh, um, uh, uh, um, good with CT that sometimes old fashioned fluoro is, is, is a dying art. Um, and some of our neoradiologists are actually really uncomfortable doing fluoro. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, Ralph, I don't know if you want to comment on that too. I totally agree. It's hard to get. Um contrast swallow it uh, after 7 p.m. 
especially in the middle of the night when you really need it. Um, if, if there is any suspicion, getting the CT with oral contrast is great. It doesn't necessarily help localize the perforation, but it can save you a step in terms of the uh, etiology. Thank you guys. Okay, so this is the chest x-ray operation got first. As you can see, most important thing that's relatively clear. Um, you see some evidence that he has some sort of a little bit of coronary disease on the left, but no effusions, no obvious air tracking up the mediastinum. So pretty benign all in all um, compared to what I'm about to show you. So this is a non-contrasted CAT scan. And as you can see, I'll play back and forth for you, but I'm really, what I'm trying to highlight is on the right side of your screen is that this is where the esophagus used to be. Um, so basically he had a giant perforation in, within the mediastinum, but again, like I mentioned, no evidence of effusion on either side. Let's play it again so you get a better idea. And then subsequent to this, um, when we evaluated him, we ordered an upper GI as our first test. Um, so of course you can see the telemetry leads, you know, just to you know, ensure diagnostic uncertainty right in the center of the screen. Um, but if you look past those, um, you can see that the contrast pretty much pools in this area kind of proximal. There is some slight extravasation out towards the patient's right side. Um, and then this bubble below is basically his gastric bubble. You can see the contrast kind of trickling down through that side as well. And the official read on this was a contained perforation within the mediastinum. So what would you do in this situation? percent of the votes in. Give people a little bit more time to answer their questions. This one sounds like it required a little bit more thinking. <laughs> All right, we have about 53% of the votes. All right, a few more people. Okay, let me share. Wow, interesting. Interesting. So 44% of our participants voted for esophageal stenting. And then just a curious too, and those who did vote for that situation um, at your institution, is it easy to get esophageal stenting? Because I've never been at an institution where they actually have stents. They always usually have to order them for the next day or subsequent day. Um, so this is a benign disease so far as we know. Um, so yes, uh, options are esophageal stenting. The interesting part of this, and Dr. A is going to kind of chime in too, is that when you have this kind of perforation, you always have to consider drainage. So this is kind of a trick question in, in some respect because the poll choice doesn't include that. Um, but drainage is always a necessary part um, when you have any kind of um, abscess disease. Um, in terms of non-operative management, don't forget that your patients tachycardic, and they do have some evidence of early end organ damage um, with liver um, elevation, so liver function elevation tests. So keep that in mind. I'm actually going to just go to the kind of the next session before we open this um, for discussion. So what if I told you it was perforated cancer? So this is the true story. So yes, MYS 56. However, he has T3N2 squamous cell cancer um, spanning 32 to 40 two centimeters from the, his incisors on. He actually underwent neoadjuvant. Sorry, Andy, could I interrupt for a moment? Um, could we just go back to that previous slide? Mm -hmm. I think it's worth discussing, uh, thinking that this is probably benign disease. So just a few quick comments, not to belabor it, but non-operative management, I think is actually an option here because it's it does seem to be a pretty contained uh, leak and process. However, um, there's some concern about the integrity of the esophagus. You don't see contrast going through very well. So it's not something you could work out prior to an endoscopy. Secondly, drainage, um, it's not an easy to, area to drain. It would require a thoracoscopy or thoracotomy. Uh, and it's a little unclear what you'd be draining. Um, esophageal stent and drainage, I think a stent would be a possibility here. 
it would require endoscopy again, so you'd get to assess what the problem is. Um, and then operative repair, sure. I mean, it depends on what you're dealing with and I'll, I'll leave the rest for the rest of your discussion. Um, thanks, sorry to interrupt. No, thank you. Um, so he completed his new adjuvant um, and it actually was booked to go for a robotic transhiatal subject to me two days prior to this presentation. He was actually at his preoperative cardiac clearance when he showed up with a heart rate of 130. So you can tell that was probably concerning. Um, and just of note, he did have a, a feeding jejunostomy place um, prior to his neoadjuvant um, because of inability to swallow when he was having episodes of chronic aspiration because of that. So again, in retrospect, now that you know that he basically has an obliterated esophagus and mediastinum due to radiation, you know, we definitely have a change in management strategy with more information. Um, and then something that we also picked up on his upper GI was kind of this little wisp of contrast that is kind of coming out of nowhere. Um, it really wasn't coming up and over the top. It was just come, coming in from like the left chest. So our car worried about now in the radiated mediastinum with a history of cancer, whether or not there's some sort of fistula disease. So that was part of our decision-making plan as well. So what do you do now when you have a malignancy? All right, a few more votes, about 31% um, of our attendees have submitted an answer. A few more. All well, the results are going all over the place. We don't have a clear winner. Let's see, 11 out of 16 people have uh, submitted an answer. All right, I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so 45% esophagectomy, as I kind of thought, considering that is the all the surgeons in this room um, and also all the kind of correct answers. So let me give you some help, right? So when you have cases of malignancy, uh, non-operative management is not an answer. Um, drainage alone is not an answer. Um, and operative repair, when you have no tissue to repair, is not an answer. Um, so I think we're all kind of on the right track uh, when in terms of in terms of malignant disease and the definitive treatment for that. Um, in terms of stenting, we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but there are some palliative options as well just to consider um, in selected patient populations. Um, and then of course, kind of our last resort um, because of morbidity, mortality, and just overall um, long-term plan that's not so great for patients um, or from an operative decision-making standpoint is exclusion and diversion. Yeah, and just a comment, Annie. I mean, I think um, we're thinking about short-term, save the patient's life, but it also has to be in the context of the bigger picture, which is how do we reestablish continuity, if at all possible, and supporting him nutritionally. And so um, in this case, I think the fact that he had malignancy and was um, under management for that, and there was already a plan in place, uh, had a significant impact on the choice that were made. Exactly. So this is kind of just in general, and we'll go back to that patient later, um, but kind of the spectrum of disease when you're thinking about when you have situations that your patients present with perforations. Um, most common is iatrogenic, um, so scope trauma during EGD, EUS, ERCP. Um, usually the most common um, is um, due to more advanced endoscopic procedures because of the blindness and the laterality of the scope. Um, but if you have a patient that has any underlying pathology as well, patients that you're considering for hellers due to their achalasia, due to any kind of stricture disease, or even malignancy itself in performing biopsies is really something that, you know, can go south quickly. Um, and one of the important decision-making factors too is like when you get this call, you know, does the endoscopist in the room still with the scope in the patient, um, or is it something that they've recognized afterwards? Um, and those are two important decision-making plans as well. Spontaneous rupture, we go back to the Warhoff syndrome um, that we talked about earlier. Um, usually those patients will have GE junction, um, but it can happen due to other kind of epiphrenic diverticular um, or zincers um, diverticulars that get overloaded, although iatrogenic is the main cause in those. Obviously traumatic, um, not only from ourselves, but also because of 
trauma patients, you can get stab wounds in the neck, GSWs to the chest, GSWs to the abdomen, foreign body ingestions. Um, this kind of goes with caustic injury as well. It's classically in children is the button battery disease um, where the alkaline is actually causes more liquefactive necrosis and full thickness injury versus the acidotic injuries that usually happen um, in adults due to suicidal intent that actually more cause um, just regular necrosis or localized. And then of course our last and like in our patient situation would be malignancy. Um, other esophageal emergencies that we're not gonna talk about today, but maybe our topics for another time are the incarcerated hypohernia um, as well as bleeding disorders. So what does it mean to have a perforation? So it's really broken down into two definitions. So you either have contained, so a minimal extravasation at whatever site of your perforation is, leading to some contamination of the mediastinum with air or the belly, um, but there's no free extravasation into any adjacent um, organs or organ structures, versus non-contained, where you do have a free extravasation of the contrast um, on your upper GI or CAT scan. Um, that's really just contaminating things um, throughout whatever space that you're in. So back again, we're talking about our diagnostic choices. Um, upper GI was long considered the gold standard before we had CAT scan technology. <laughs> Something that Dr. I and I were kind of talking about too is whether or not you choose to start with a water-soluble contrast um, or proceed with a thin barium, dilute barium solution first, and then subsequently with gastrographin or the opposite way around. Um, so both forms have risks and benefits. Obviously, in aspirating patients that you're really concerned about, um, you're not going to cause flash pulmonary edema in those patients or want to avoid that. So starting with thin barium um, has a better potential to avoid that, but still have a high degree of diagnostic certainty um, because of the sensitivity is higher with that solution. Obviously, it also has its downsides. If you put barium in and it extravasates, um, you want to repeat that scan after you fix that esophagus, you're still going to have barium in the chest. Um, so it can also, you have to think of your long-term solution in terms of your management options. I may need to barge in and to emphasize Dr. Jayaraja's point. Some guests, you're not, you may need to train your radiologist. Uh, you know, generally, if you don't think there's an airway problem, you'd start with uh, water soluble. But to some guests, some radiologists will leave it at that. And so it's important to insist if it hasn't shown a leak and you have a suspicion to do, do the dilute barium because it is more sensitive. Thank you. Um, and then also to kind of to uh, piggyback off sorry, that. Um, I, sorry to jump in, Annie. I just wanted to ask Dr. Um, Dr. A also. Um, we've moved to using oral gastrograph, I mean, uh, Omnipeg, excuse me. And that seems to have the least risk of both of those things, at least as your first uh, swallow, because, um, you know, as Annie's brought up, this issue of aspiration and getting water soluble in your lung is is a big deal. So ha have you guys done that? I believe that's what we use routinely also, yeah. Okay, and uh, Matt, uh, any any experience, Matt Smith, with any thoughts regarding contrast agents for upper GIs, if you wanna jump in? Matt Smith, are you there? Okay, if not, Reed Fletcher. Okay, I guess everyone's very quiet. Sorry, Annie, P please keep going. That's okay. Um, yeah, and just to piggyback off of that too, you know, if you do your gastrographin and your barium and you're still convinced your patient has a leak, um, CAT scan does provide another alternative to, you know, kind of delayed phase imaging of that. Also in patients that aren't able to swallow, patients that may already be intubated, um, it's a good alternative um, to the traditional upper GI. Or if you have any kind of atypical presentation that's not really straightforward or doesn't make much sense, um, it does make more sense to proceed with the upper GI than CAT scan algorithm. Um, and then endoscopy, unless you have a scope in there already um, or looking straight out the hole, um, is obviously a very sensitive test, but not recommended due to the obvious risk of going right through that perforation again. So in terms of where this happens, all about location. Um, so in the cervical esophagus, cerv cervical esophagus really is the most straightforward. Um, when in doubt, you drain it. You open the uh, left neck or the right neck, whatever your contrast goes. 
Um, usually you can drain it um, straight through our typical uh, esophageal uh, conduit and osteomotic incision as everyone's familiar with, but you can also go behind um, the carotid sheath and drain in that direction. Leave it open, leave a drain, treat your patient with MPO, IV antibiotics, um, and in those situations, you usually don't have to proceed with any further, further resection. When it gets into the chest, you always remember the left, right, left rule um, is something that comes up all the time. So really want to follow your contrast or follow the fluid of your effusion um, when you kind of make decisions about which chest to proceed in, um, and whether or not to actually extend into a thoracoabdominal um, incision as well. Uh, and one point too, when you're making your thoracotomy, try to remember to mobilize the uh, intercostal muscle pedicle when you're going in. It's uh, it can save you a lot of trouble down the road. That's true. Always need a nice flap too. Good. Um, and then just a side note too, if you have your friendly thoracic surgeon, if you don't have privileges too, that may make a you know decision point about you know how you proceed into the chest or not. So when it comes to these patients, now that you kind of have a diagnostic workup and you are concerned that yes, they do have a diagnosis of esophageal perforation, how do you decide? Um, so obviously you look at your patient. If they're unstable, what are they gonna tolerate? What kind of comorbidities do they have? Do they have malignancy or is this benign disease? And that really kind of goes all into the spectrum of, you know, what, how can you ensure the safest but also the best outcome for your patient? Time to, get to, time to diagnosis, as we already kind of spoke about before, um, traditionally is that 24 hour window um, because patients have worse outcomes after that. Uh, however, if you have someone that you are able to offer an intervention to, you know, don't hesitate because of the theoretical 24 hour rule. And then when it comes down to technical factors, how much contamination do you have? Are you able to control your sepsis with drains? Do you have to do something more extensive um, again, benign versus malignant tissue. You're not going to sew back together cancer to cancer. It's first of all, it's not going to hold, and second of all, it's not going to get rid of your cancer. Um, and then, even for benign diseases like achalasia, or a situation where you have severe stricture disease, if you have mega esophagus, you know th th those tissues are already compromised. So you may have to think of some sort of alternative route um, or conduit in those situations. Um, and then, of course, there's always a push towards doing things more minimally invasively. Um, this is an advanced GI surgical fellowship, um, but it's also minimally invasive in many of our fellowships. So I have actually done one robotic bore hobs, um, basically primary enclosure and drainage. Turned out well. Um, again, small sample size, but try to think for those patients, as long as they're able to tolerate neuroperitoneum, uh, whether or not you can give them a, the advantages of a minimally invasive technique as well. So kind of go back to our options for benign disease, operate. Primary repair, that's your gold standard. Um, that's still what we're pushing for in these patients. Um, unless they have a, something that you feel that you can manage non-operatively, which we'll also include later. Um, so to breed any kind of dead non-viable tissue, expose your complete um, perforation. So you do have to do that myotomy to expose the entirety of the mucosa. Then reapproximate your good tissue in two layers and don't forget to buttress. Um, again, even if you believe this is benign disease, you never truly really know. Um, so the utility of having pathologists on hand for frozens um, definitely can come in handy. You always wanna widely drain because that's gonna be your saving grace later, especially in an area that's so difficult for interventional radiology to access. As Dr. I talked about, think about your flaps as you enter. What are you gonna use as a buttress? Um, and then how well do you trust your repair is gonna hold in five days when you get your upper GI, whether or not you're gonna be able to feed your patient um, by mouth, or do you think they're gonna need some alternative access kind of as a safety valve, so to speak. More, um, older techniques too that kind of talk about and really depend on the tissue integrity and um, kind of how you're trained um, are repair over a drain or repair over a T-tube, kind of creating a controlled fistula situation. Um, I don't have personal experience with that, but if anyone on the call does and can let us know, you know how you've really accomplished that, that would be great. Um, and then of course, in these patients with benign disease, like we talked about, if the tissue isn't good, 
if they have some sort of mega esophagus or achalasia, or they just have terrible mo mobility, you do have to think of the more advanced um, techniques. Um, also in patients that are unstable, um, just to, for the safety of them, um, to get them through that operation, really have the last resort um, when it comes to exclusion and diversion, but it's something that's still on the table. Um, and, and then comment, when we comment about the um, <clears throat> closure, thank you for emphasizing the importance of exposure. I think everybody knows that, the, but the mucosal um, defect is almost always longer than the muscular defect. And so you really have to be bold in opening up the muscle and make sure you've exposed the corners of the mucosa for the two layer closure. And then secondly, the T-tube comes in, especially if you've got loss of integrity um, where you've lost part of the wall, for example, gunshot or some chronic process, uh, maybe the uh, maybe the hole occurred three or four days ago um, and you don't think it's going to hold to sew it together. And so closing it over a T-tube gives you control um, sort of controlled fistula. So that's the value of it. We don't use it very often, but it can work extraordinarily well. So I, I actually wanted to jump in there because Ralph actually gave me some advice on a case that I think was worth talking about where there was a fishbone perforation, Ralph. I think I called you about this case and this woman had this mature diverticulum that was basically a sort of getting infected abscess cavity. And this was one of the circumstances where Dr. A talked about a T-tube in that location, which I hadn't really used or thought about before. So I thought that it was um, uh, really uh, an interesting way to address this. Um, and you talked about doing that and then pulling it back and letting it sit in the cavity that you've debrided. And again, we use this in other areas, but I've never used it in the esophagus. So I just wanted to make that comment, Ralph. Thank you. Yeah. And then, of course, your other option made popular by Dr. Cameron is don't operate. Um, so not operative is not conservative management. Um, so the I had an attending that used to say, what's the conservative management for uh, splenic laceration? And that would be splenectomy, which, as we know, is not conservative. Um, so in these patients, what you're kind of looking for and the criteria we're going to talk about on the next page, um, but basically the management that you're doing is providing drainage and providing a way for them to get nutrition so they can heal um, using the body's own natural mechanism. So don't feed them, have them hate you, resuscitate them, place them on TPN. You wanna cover them broadly with not only antibiotics, um, but also antifungal agents. Um, and then comes in the roles for non-operative management, but still interventional um, techniques such as stenting, drainage, even putting in chest tubes, and then don't forget feeding access if you need it. Um, so that's either past the injury with a Dobhoff um, that's fluoroscopically guided or taking them and going for uh, formal jejunostomy uh, placement or gastrostomy in some cases. Although some people would argue that you always wanna save the stomach for an esophagectomy just in case. So what are your options for malignant disease? It's really on the border of operate. Um, this is really the tried and true mechanism um, for any kind of malignancy in general, even when it's not perforated. The question is, in this perforated patient, you know, are they stable enough that you can resect them and perform immediate reconstruction? Or do you need to think about delayed reconstruction through an alternate conduit? Um, and then again, the option of last resort being that occlusion and diversion. Um, in patients that do have advanced diseases, metastatic disease, really poor performance status, and are not going to tolerate that esophagectomy, um, there is a small but limited role of palliative stenting in these patients, um, knowing that they probably, you know, will not survive the course of an esophagectomy, but at least be able to give them, you know, some reasonable source control with drainage and associated with stenting. And again, same plan, don't forget your frozen section, don't forget your drainage, and don't forget that you need to feed your patient. And one huge point to make with regard to um, esophagectomy and delayed, um, big point here, if you're ever forced into that situation, leave the proximal esophagus as long as you reasonably can and bring it out subcutaneously to exit over the manubrium rather than the neck. It's enormously easier to manage and it gives you more length for subsequent reconstruction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, actually, let me ask you about that, Ralph. So a lot of people on the call have never done a spit fistula, I imagine, because we've got so good at not needing to do this. Yeah. Um, I always felt that when we had to do this, when I was a trainee or when I've done this a couple of times afterwards, that these people never seem to swallow well after reconstruction. Is that your experience too? Absolutely. I think that that is, as Annie said, it's a, sort of a last resort procedure. Um, you're sort of buggering up the cervical esophagus in addition to what's already happened downstream. And um, the diversion isn't all that great. If you've left the esophagus in, you still have some contamination. Um, yeah, it's, you know, for a patient who's dying, it's, a, it's an appropriate thing. But I agree with you, Rohan. It's, uh, it creates its own set of issues. Um, let me ask uh, Dr. Welsh, you're kind enough to join us. David Welsh is a, is a general su surgeon in rural practice, and uh, I think we're of the same ilk. So do you want to comment, David? Have you had experience, our, our talk today is in esophageal perforation. Have you had any experience with uh, cervical esophagostomy from your previous lives? Just to say, let me get my, there we go. Um, I'm in a rural setting, so I've had to do some limited, but fortunately I've been able to get folks to a tertiary center for more definitive. Um, the description you had about um, non-operative, I, uh, I would maybe change it to um, waiting to operate, so to speak, um, and getting the things done to, to optimize the patient. Um, Fortunately, uh, even in very bad situations, I'm, I'm an hour away from a tertiary center. So except for very bad weather, we can initiate the process working with our colleagues in the tertiary center and get the resuscitation done while we're arranging for transport. Perfect. And we've also got Dr. Sharona Ross on the phone. So we can, we can ask her for some comments in just a minute, Annie, if you want to keep going. Sure. Um, so how did this non-operative management come about? So Cameron's original paper actually had a patient population of eight. So it was a case series of eight, which back in the day is really a landmark paper. It's surprising to find out that it was based on you know, his own personal experience with these patients. Um, but basically what he found is that he was able to successfully operate, um, successfully manage the patients without operation as long as four criteria were met. So as long as this disruption is contained, um, it drains back into the esophagus. So anytime you have that perforation, it drains back on itself. Patients had minimal symptoms and minimal signs of sepsis, which is really what we have adopted um, now. But this is kind of what it's all built on. Um, so what this um, built out from is from the University of Pittsburgh. And this is probably the most um, famous uh, study in terms of how to manage uh, esophageal perforations in modern times. Um, so their idea was that patients with this minimal contamination can be managed non-operatively. Um, and they had their surgeons just make their own independent decisions about whether or not to operate in these situations based on whether or not patients had extensive contamination um, and whether or not they had sepsis, not on traumatic perforation, iatrogenic or otherwise. What they actually found was that the operative management is still the gold standard, um, but in select patient populations, you can implement a non-operative strategy. Um, and again, as everyone pointed out, that non-operative strategy is that initial resuscitation, control of contamination. Um, and there is always a potential that you'll have to convert to a later to an operative form, depending on your patient's clinical course. Um, but what they pretty much developed from this um, is that in operative and non-operative, there was a st statistically significant difference in duration of stay, complication, and, mort um, and complication rate between operative and non-operative patient groups. Um, however, their mortality, which is a little less than the average, around 20%, that's usually published, was about 14%. So even with these kinds of interventions, mortality rate in these patients is quite high. Um, and of course, this was a single center retrospective study multiple surgeons using multiple different techniques um, and making their own independent decisions, um, as well as some decisions for whether or not they employed stents or not um, was unclear as to what the indication was or what their reasoning was behind that as well. Um, so based off of this, um, they developed something called the perforation severity score, which is really 
what Cameron said in more concrete terms. So based on the criteria, um, each patient was given a PSS score. Um, so lower risk criteria being, you know, like age, heart rate, white blood cell count, things that are still going to be elevated in patients, um, but lower down in the spectrum of disease because it can happen in patients with either controlled or uncontrolled extravasation of contrast. Next would be really, what is your patient's clinical picture? Are they febrile? Is it non-contained? Do they have some sort of underlying respiratory compromise? Are they intubated? Are they already aspirating? Um, and then of course our favorite, is it been over a day since the time you know, that perfor perforation occurred to the time they show up at your door? And then three, which is the most risky, of course, is patients with malignancy or those that are hypotensive. Um, and it really just shows that based on this stratification of the PSS score is that your, as you would expect, your percentage of complication rate, your mortality rate, and your duration of stay all increase um, with increasing PSS. So like I said, this is single center. Um, so what um, the European study actually did, and it was a multi-center uh, trial, is actually use the PSS score in a totally different patient population to see if they could apply that and then develop an algorithm based on whatever their patient's PSS score was. Um, so when you have lower end of the spectrum, you're talking about the contained leak patients. Um, and as you get higher, um, of course, you're talking about your more advanced strategies that you're going to have to employ. And they pretty much used this as a decision tree for how they were going to make, you know, decisions regarding the patients that showed up at their door. Um, they found this retrospectively that, of course, those with the higher rate over five had a considerable mortality versus patients in the lower score. So they felt more comfortable with patients with lower PSSs managing them non operatively in the future. Just of note too, if you have a PSS over nine, it's a virtual 0% survival rate. Um, so it's something that's helpful to, you know, to tell family members or patients um, that show up at your door kind of based on, you know, what their degree of severity is on this system, whether or not, you know, you really need to make what kind of decision um, in terms of palliative options or something that's more aggressive as well. This is a nice flow chart. It's really well thought out. I know our eyes glaze over when we see something like this, but I wonder if this could be sent out to all the participants. It's a nice summary. Of course, yeah. Um, and then we kind of echoed on this as well too, but you know, what is the role of esoph esophagectomy in these patients with um, perforation? Of course, malignancy, like we talked about megaesophagus, any kind of caustic in ingestion where your tissue is just completely liquefied. Um, as well as persistent undilatable stricture disease um, where despite your best attempts or your endoscopist's best attempts, you know, really nothing is getting past that area that was previously perforated. Um, and we kind of alluded to this as well as like, can you do a two-stage or can you do, uh, you know, primary resection and reconstruction? Do you have to think about alternate conduit choices? Um, so this comes back into your feeding access when you're managing non-operatively too. You know, do you want to violate that stomach knowing that maybe later you're going to have to use it? Do you want to use jejunum? Do you want to use right colon? Do you want to use left colon? You do have a lot of options. When you're approaching the mediastinum too that has considerable contamination, do you want to think about an alternate route um, when you eventually go back and put that conduit up? Because once you basically have that kind of disease, your mediastinum is going to be so fibrous that going back in that same route is potentially treacherous, um, if not impossible. Um, so do you need to think about a retrosternal approach um, or even subcutaneous, which is sounds crazy, but you know, as long as you have a connection, like we talked about the mortality um, and morbidity with a spit fistula is not great either. So back to our patient. So what did we end up doing? So we resuscitated him, we put him on antibiotics and antifungals. Um, and although this is a topic of esophageal emergencies, um, we actually ended up taking him to the operating room on the same day um, that he was planned for surgery, which was actually on hospital day two. So in our patient, thoracotomy or not? It's really it's a test of who is a thoracic surgeon here and who is a foregut surgeon. About 41% of the votes in. We'll give everyone a few more minutes to weigh in. Well, not minutes, but a few more moments. 
We have 58 percent. Give a few more people the chance to vote. <laughs> All right. That's 76 percent of people to vote. So I'll share the results. Okay, if there is an effusion or if CT surgery is available, I like that question too. I like that answer too. So yes, like we said before, follow your effusion. In our case, there was no effusion, so no thoracotomy. And then what is your best approach? Are you doing transhiatal? Are you doing Ivor Lewis? Or are you doing all three holes? Right, the polls in progress. We have 41% of our participants have voted so far. Dum, 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 dum. Yeah, I should have prepared music. <laughs> dum, dum, dum. Da, da, da. While everyone right, got about 58%, 64%. While while everyone's uh, voting, can I ask Dr. Ross? Do you have an Do you have any thoughts on this, Sharona? Unfortunately, I missed the presentation at the beginning. Is this cancer? Is this uh, a perforation that from benign disease? It's it's from cancer. It's a metasophical squame that was undergoing chemotherapy and showed up two days before his planned operation with a contained perf. Got you. So uh, it's uh, it's only contained, and you were planning to do an operation anyway. Correct. Yeah. But in general, when you're looking at these patients, what is your approach for esophagectomy, Sharona? This is a mid Transiatal. I do robotic transiatal esophagectomy, but I keep the, the door open to do it a thorac, you know, a, a, a laparoscopic or robotic approach to the thorax if need be. Okay. Thanks, Sharona. In the interest of time, Annie, what did you keep going? Really it depends can where body of the disease where the, do i think it's going to be stuck i've done it before also in the prone position if i think that the major vessels might be uh involved and so it really depends on the patient but if i had an, an uh, um even a contained perforation that i plan to do an operation i will still take it to the, the patient to the operating room and do the operation with the reconstruction okay thanks thanks Joshua. annie it just takes a while to advance. Not advancing. <coughs> um, and then what's your best option? So now you have a content contaminated mediastinum like we talked about. How are you gonna put up your conduit? All right. Voting is in progress. 52% of the votes have been submitted. So far, one of the answer has has zero percent of the votes. So it looks like we have a, a strong winner. We'll get seventy six percent of people voted. All right, all right. Let's share the results. So retro sternal. So what did we do um, first? Like I talked about. Oh, I mentioned that fistula earlier on the imaging. So just want to make sure that we didn't need any more advanced techniques. We did bronchoscopy first. Um, obviously, we would not have attempted uh, translatal subjectomy alone if we thought there was a fistula. Um, we did end up doing that. We did it open um, just because we knew we would eventually need more access as well. Um, and then we did pass our gastric conduit externally. We snuck a drain up the mediastinum that drained into the abdomen. Um, and then he already had his feeding access from his prior jejunostomy placement. So our plan A succeeded. Um, we did talk about um, options as well, whether or not we needed a spit fistula and it really all depended on our clinical situation and then our operative findings. Uh, we were didn't plan on going in the mediastinum, but it ended up that we were really unable to because our esophagus itself was pretty much obliterated. Um, so we did unfortunately have some esophagus some esophagus behind, um, but it was more proxical. Proxim Can I jump in and ask two questions, please? Mm -hmm. um, so, first question, I was a little surprised by the. Annie, if you uh, could mute yourself. Sorry. I have to unshare to do it, though. That's oh, fine. no, it's okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, I turned off my mic. Is that, can anyone, everyone hear me? Great. Um, so, I was a little surprised by that. Last um, the last question, where uh, some patients or some people. 
you just muted Eddie. So I was a little surprised by the last survey where um, the the mediastinum was an option for conduit access. My my thinking here was that because that area is contaminated, that we would we would have to use a different route. Would it, from the experienced surgeons, would you use the mediastinum? Is that an option for bringing up the conduit? That was my first question. Second question is: This is a perforated cancer, and so. Um, oncologically, what are we looking at here? Even if we do an esophagectomy uh, with a reconstruction, what are we looking at from an oncological standpoint? Because if I have a HCC that's perforated, if I have a colon cancer that's perforated, um, and the, that that affects the the, the, the survival and then what non non oncological treatment for these patients. Yeah, I think those are great questions. So, uh, any of the faculty on the call wanna wanna answer that? Ralph, would you would you tell? Yeah, I guess um, so. From the standpoint of um, drainage, <clears throat> I'm not sure that the infection in the mediastinum is that big an issue. You've already got it widely drained. Um, the big issue is conduit survivability, and if we think the infection would compromise um, blood supply, but I wouldn't be super uncomfortable bringing it up to the mediastinum for that reason. I, I certainly agree that if this is a uh, if there's spillage of cancer into the mediastinum and you're concerned about recurrence, that's the wrong thing to do. The flip side of it is that uh, retrosternal is a little bit longer route. Um, so this is in a, a semi-urgent situation. And so blood supply to the distal conduit could be an issue. And then secondly, that area um, in the neck behind the manubrium is sometimes problematic and requires resection of the head of the manubrium, uh, head of the first rib. So. Um, I don't think it's a real black and white decision. Awesome. And then perhaps the most controversial topic of this entire talk is when do you do your post-op esophagram? All right, votes are rolling in. We have about 50, no, 64% of the votes have been answered. Give people another second or two to submit their reply. So five days, yeah, I'm not really sure where this idea of the five days come from, but it's something that, you know, usually comes up in a lot of the literature. I know at our institution, we're pushing towards day four day, possibly in the future of this year. We'll see what happens if the patient's clinically doing well. Yeah, we are doing that. Um, so, but I think it really, you know, it depends on how your patient looks. Obviously, you know, they're going to leak by the way they're looking already. You don't need a test to prove it. Um, but then again, if you never have leaks, you also don't need to test. And that's a little tongue in cheek. Um, but the point is, if they're clinically stable, I think you can really talk about progression just to make sure you um, get a study to prove it. So this is our post-op day five upper GI, as you can talk about. Dr. A kind of beat me to the punch. So our retral sternum conduit, we got this picture and it pretty much cut off right here on the original imaging. So just what you spoke about is definitely the angulation. And just to prove it, like Dr. Kurt said before, we actually got a, a CAT scan immediately subsequent to that, which did show that the contours passed through. It just had a little longer route to take um, down the back of the, the sternum. So our patient did well. He actually um, ended up having complete treatment response uh, to new adjuvant therapy. So he had no residual tumor on the specimen that we took out during his operation. Um, but because of his residual esophagus, he will you know, continue to undergo surveillance. Um, he was discharged on post-op day 10 to rehab um, on liquid dye by mouth and jejunostomy feeds. And he's been in clinic and he's doing well. So this is not something that I covered in the scope of our uh, case presentation, but kind of looking forward that, you know, you do have other options for, for management of these patients um, that are included under the non-operative window. So that has to do with clips, stents, um, and endovac. So Dr. I, please chime in. Um, but endoscopic clips um, really are popular for a variety of different um, situations, but really when it comes to perforation, the best is when you see the perforation, you can take care of it right away. 
Um, so this kind of form of management is really better as your primary therapy, um, not as your salvage mechanism. And it really depends on the size of your perforation, the stability of your patient, um, and what exactly you have available um, in your toolbox in terms of CLIP. Um, again, there is no randomized control trial for endoscopic CLIP management in perforated esophageal disease. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, and the success rates are variable. Um, sometimes it's used as a temporizing measure to, to control contamination. So if that is an option that you feel comfortable with, then uh, that's a good starting point for further progression of all the other management that we talked about. In terms of stents, um, like we talked, is an interesting uh, kind of a lot of the literature on this actually has to do with post esophagectomy leak um, and the success rate of stenting in those situations, but it has also been used upfront in um, other forms of perforation. Um, stents go in, they come out within two to four weeks. Um, again, better with a shorter diagnostic time, really has to do with contamination control. If your defect is small, um, if you have obviously benign disease more than malignant disease, um, but they are prone to complications. Most famously would be stent migration. Um, and it's also difficult to manipulate stents if you need to uh, push them in. It's actually a lot easier to retrieve them back because that's what they're designed to do. They can cause bleeding um, as well as erosion through your esophageal wall. Um, however, there has been data that shown that there is decreased morbidity, length of stay, and time to oral intake um, when compared to surgical methods. And that would really be in those patients that can be managed non-operatively alone um, and not those that require more extensive operations. And then Annie, finally- I'll jump in here because you asked me to. So, um, you know, I think going back to the fundamental point you started with, esophageal perforations are a true emergency. It's all hands on deck, 20% mortality. So anything we do short of an open repair and mediastinal drainage and debris mont is a compromise. Having said that, stents have been a real game changer in selected patients. They really do work. They're not good in the cervical esophagus. They're not good across the GE junction if you have a bore hobbies with a tear because of sealing, but um, they really do work well. And even if they don't seal completely, they reduce the contamination so much that they will usually turn a septic patient into a non-septic patient. Um, they do have to be combined with drainage whenever it's necessary. They're, they're not an end in themselves. If there's mediastinal collection or pleural collection, they still have to be drained well. And I think that, that covers it. Thank you. Um, and then the ultimate drain, um, which is vacuum therapy. Um, so these, again, have been used most famously in anastomotic leaks after esophagectomy um, in poor surgical candidates, those that have failed other treatments, so people that have already had primary repairs that failed, um, and obviously uh, other cases of perforation. Um, this does require a little bit more extensive therapy. What you basically do is intubate your patient as if you're getting them ready for a regular endoscopy. Um, you actually attach a piece of black, you pass the endotube, tube, attach a piece of black foam to it, and then use the scope to kind of push it down into your area, um, get it into that cavity so it sits nicely. And then you have your patient hooked up to suction for about three to five days between back changes. Um, and just as you would expect, just a typical wound back um, magic happens and granulation tissue forms um, over the course of your changes. Um, and eventually that cavity size will shrink um, just as if when you have wound infections and you want to know if you have that soupy um, kind of infected purulence, it's not going to work as well as if you have nice clean tissue. Um, so it will take several back changes in order to um, have that happen and not have our yellow slough kind of form um, that impedes your granulation formation. Um, outcomes with this. questions on the chat was how much suction do you put on that? Do you know? I don't when know often. Sorry? I don't know either. We've used it in our center, but I can't tell you exactly what the suction is. I will say that this is for the stable patient and it's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and any in the interest of time, we probably need to wrap up pretty soon. Sure. This is like almost our last thing. Um, but there have been successes in the largest study, which is about 100 patients. Um, so just keep that in mind as something in your toolbox as well. And of course, there's always complications. Um, so Robert Burns is famous Scottish poet. He's an inspiration for mice and men. So even with your best laid plans, you can have persistent leak, persistent contamination, and that's when you go to some additional maneuvers. 
Um, and then just based on the malnutrition, um, based on the patient population, dehiscence is always an issue in these patients um, that have more chronic disease, as well as any potential stricture and stenosis that you'll later have to undergo dilation for. So just in conclusion, um, decision-making in these settings requires knowledge of both surgical and non-surgical options. And I think, you know, going through this lecture, I've definitely learned a lot more about the non-surgical options. Um, even though as a surgeon, I love to cut, I also like to know when not to cut. Um, and other thing I picked up too is from from the Indiana University um, the Level 1 Esophageal Center is that a multidisciplinary team um, can really make a difference in these patients from the triage situation in the rural setting to the transfer to getting the operating room ready um, and using those endoscopists for their endoluminal um, techniques as well. And then most importantly, having a plan A is great, having a plan B is good, but always have a plan C because you never know when the first two will fail. And special thanks to Dr. I for being our guest moderator for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone for being on. Dr. Stain, did you have any comments uh, uh, as our uh, board chair? Well, I, I, I apologize for having to go back and forth between two calls, but I think the presentation was exceptional. And thank, thank you, Dr. I, for providing commentary. Uh, the only thing I would say is not an esophageal surgeon, but from giving the boards, you have to know the appropriate non-operative management. And I think there's some criteria written about, you know, less than two centimeters, all drains back in the esophagus. And I think that, you know, although I think Dr. I said, operative is, is the, 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 the norm, but there are particular patients, especially at the Pittsburgh series that shows they can be treated non-operatively, but drainage is also important. And even if you treat them non-operatively, you have to get have adequate drainage so they don't get any mediastinal sepsis. But but I think I think uh, it was a great presentation, and, and thank you everybody for uh, putting it all together. Well, thank you for the support of the SSA. Team. Ron, can I say one? Yes, yes. Can sure. I say one 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 comment? Um, you know, when I when I started to do robotic surgery. Surgery. So let's say for worse, right? So on five, day five, we do the, we start feeding and all that. Robotics changed it to, a, you know, like on day two, now we start to feed whipples. Same deal we did with the esophagectomy. So I do robotic transital. You're cutting out, Sharona. We lost you. Um, what I'll do is I'll try and get the comment from her and send this to the group, um, because we an Two, and now we shorten dramatically your entire length of stay and they do better. Now it's not for every patient, but it's just food for thought. Things that we were taught, this is the way to do it. It really is a, depending on the individual patient. Right. No, I think that's a really good point. And we haven't got so far as to get rid of the NG tubes in these patients, but there are some European centers that do this without a nasogastric tube. We've been contemplating that as part of our ERAS protocol. Well, in the interest of time and to respect everyone's time, I just want to thank you all for being here. I especially want to thank Dr. Benzi. Uh, Dr. Barrera, if you could help me uh, rally your co-fellows for our next presentation, that would be great. Uh, and thank you for joining us and being on time and all that good stuff. I really appreciate it. And of course, Dr. Kurtz, thank you for making this possible with the uh, group too, and also being one of my previous uh, trainees. I'm so proud of, proud of you and everything that you're doing. Um, so, uh, Ralph, again, thank you. Uh, we look forward to continuing this effort. Look forward to the support of the SSAT. Uh, thank you, LK, for also making this possible. And, uh, and we'll, we'll get this out on uh, Facebook or, or on some, uh, some outlet. Thanks, everyone. Any, thank any great job, Annie. I'm very proud of you. you nice job, Annie. Answer, okay, Sharona. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, -bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, thank you.